Hello and welcome. I'm Paul Kilmer, Director of Public Programs at the National Building Museum in Washington, D.C. Thank you for joining us from the DMV and from all over the country. We're glad to have you with us. For those of you who may not know about us, the National Building Museum inspires curiosity about the world we build for ourselves through groundbreaking exhibitions and programs such as this. Since earlier this year, we've been relying on an online form format to bring you informative, incisive, and intelligent content. Tonight's program is no exception. The museum has been exploring the built environment, those places where we live, work, and play for nearly 40 years. While most of that focus has been on buildings and landscapes, we have also explored the equally important world of interiors of our everyday lives and their contributions to our emotions, productivity, and well being. This book talk, The Great Indoors, the surprising signs of how buildings shape our behavior furthers that exploration and is generously supported by the APGAR Fund for Excellence in the Built Environment. We have a video message from Clayton APGAR who says a few words about the fund and its purpose. Greetings to the National Building Museum community. My name is Clayton APGAR. My family and I are delighted to support tonight's program as a part of our commitment to design education and literacy. We are grateful to Emily for being here to discuss her fascinating book with us and to the museum, both for this forum and for its larger mission, exploring the power of built space in our world. We look forward to the conversation and send our best to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Clayton to you and your family for your ongoing support of the museum's mission. Before we get started, I wanted to mention our next online program. The museum's long running Spotlight on Design series continues on November, November 10th. Hear from founding principal of New York-based ODA, Iran Chen, on the firm's exploration into new fractal forms in architecture and its impact on the future of cities and society. You can find out more information about this program and purchase tickets at nbm.org. Finally, a few technical notes to mention. This is a live broadcast where everything can go wrong, but hopefully won't. But we will also make an edited pro re uh, recording of the program available on our website within 10 days. Closed captioning is available as an option by clicking the closed caption button in your window. And finally, send us your questions via the Q&A button, and we'll do our best to get them answered in the time we have together. And now it is my pleasure to welcome our guest. Emily Anthes is a science journalist and author. Her new book, The Great Indoors, featured tonight, was published in June. She is also the author of Frankenstein's Cat, Cuddling Up to Biotech's Brave New Beasts, which has lo was long listed for the Penn EEO -E Wilson Literary Science Writing Award. Emily's work has also appeared in the New York Times, The New Yorker, The Atlantic, Wired, Nature, Slate, Business Week, and elsewhere. Her magazine features have won several awards, including the AAAS Kavli Science Journalism Award and the NASW Science and Society Journalism Award. Emily has a master's degree in science writing from MIT and a bachelor's degree in the history of science and medicine from Yale, where she also studied creative writing. Please welcome Emily Anthes. Hi, thank you all for joining us tonight. I have a bunch of images I'm going to talk through. Um, thank you so much for having me and for the generous, generous introduction, Paul. I'm really excited to be here with all of you. Um, as you just heard, my name is Emily Anthes, and I'm the author of The Great Indoors, The Surprising Science of How Buildings Shape Our Behavior, Health, and Happiness. And tonight I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the promise of evidence-based design and how we can apply some of its lessons to create healthier indoor spaces. Uh, that's something that might be especially relevant to all of us as we are cooped up uh, presumably in the coming months. But I wanna start by telling you a story about a hospital, a 200 bed hospital in Pennsylvania. 
And in the 1970s and 80s, at least, one wing of the hospital looked like this. The patient rooms along the corridor were all essentially identical, except for one big difference, the view. So as you can probably see from this diagram, the rooms on one half, the left half of the corridor, looked out onto a small grove of trees, while the rooms and the other side of the corridor looked out onto a brick wall. In the early 1980s, a pioneering researcher named Roger Ulrich got curious about whether these differing views might affect patient outcomes. So he analyzed the medical records of people who'd had their gallbladders removed at the hospital. Half had been assigned to one of these types of rooms and half had been assigned to the other. And he found stark differences. On average, patients who had nature views, the views of the trees, needed fewer doses of nar narcotics and were also discharged from the hospital about a day sooner. Ulrich published his study in Science, which is uh, just about as prestigious a scientific journal as there is, in 1984. And this was a watershed moment. The publication of this paper is frequently cited as the beginning of a new era and the birth of what eventually came to be known as evidence-based design. There are a lot of different definitions for evidence-based design, but in general, what it refers to is architects, designers, and planners who draw upon rigorous studies and the scientific literature to create spaces that they hope will lead to certain outcomes, whether that's quicker recoveries in a hospital, higher productivity in an office, or something like better sleep in a home. Why does evidence-based design matter? Well, modern humans have essentially become an indoor species. We spent about 90% of our time indoors, and that stat is from our pre-pandemic uh, era. So these days, it's probably even higher than 90%. But evidence-based design gives us a suite of tools we can use to create indoor spaces that help improve our lives. And the big overarching takeaway of my book is simple. Indoor spaces affect us in profound and sometimes surprising ways. So in the first part of this talk, I'm gonna start by walking through some of the elements of the indoor environment that science suggests matter most. So I opened by walking you through Ulrich's study, which has become an absolute classic in the field, uh, but really it's just the beginning. There is lots of subsequent research that has reinforced and expanded upon his findings. And there's now a really robust scientific literature that makes clear that nature views and exposure to nature in general can have really powerful positive effects on our bodies. To name just a few, Nature exposure can reduce pain, reduce stress, reduce blood pressure, and even boost the immune system. What makes nature so potent? Well, one common explanation is what's known as the biophilia hypothesis. The general idea is that because of how we evolved out in the rough and tumble of nature, we have this innate affinity for the natural world. So nature tends to catch our eye and engage us, essentially serving as a positive distraction from stress, pain, and anxiety. But it turns out nature isn't just good for our bodies. Studies demonstrate that it has a variety of cognitive benefits as well, including improving attention, memory, learning, and productivity. There are a lot of studies that demonstrate this, but uh, to give just a couple of examples, um, Research shows that standardized test scores are higher at schools that are surrounded by greenery than at those that are surrounded by man-made landscapes. And this is after controlling for other sorts of potentially confounding factors. And another study has found that bringing plants into offices improves productivity and concentration among employees. So scientists explain these cognitive benefits with a theory that's slightly different, but related to the biophilia hypothesis. And this cognitive uh, hypothesis is known as attention restoration theory. And the theory basically holds that the tasks of everyday life are cognitively and mentally taxing, that they're difficult, they use up our mental resources. 
Looking at nature, on the other hand, is engaging, but it's an effortless kind of engagement. It catches our eye and attention, but it doesn't require us to do a lot of mental work when we're looking out at landscapes. And so the idea is that this helps give our brains a break and restores and refreshes our attention so that when we turn back to that grocery list or that memo or that spreadsheet, we feel revived and restored. So the good news about these findings is that nearly any kind of nature seems to do the trick. So some of the early studies were about views. And so if you happen to have a view out of your home or office onto a natural landscape, that's great. And that will probably have a lot of benefits. But even if you don't, you're not out of luck. Uh, bringing plants into your home or workspace can have a lot of the same benefits. And so can even things like nature images. So panoramic photos of natural landscapes, um, as well as nature sounds. So listening to birdsong or a babbling brook through your headphones can have some of the same restorative benefits as well. So that's nature. Another really key way to improve our indoor spaces is to find ways to maximize daylight. And one reason that daylight is so important is because it keeps our circadian rhythms or internal biological clocks set to the right time. Daylight exposure is particularly important in the morning. So it's exposure to short wavelength light, that is the light on the cooler, bluer end of the visible spectrum, that helps suppress our melatonin levels in the morning and synchronizes our biological clocks with the solar day. That in turn has multiple benefits, including helping us remain alert during the day and helping us fall asleep at night. There's also a well-documented connection between sunlight and mood. Exposure to more light and to brighter light seems to boost mood, studies suggest. And the exact mechanism is still unclear and, and up for debate a bit, but there is research that suggests that light exposure can boost uh, the production of serotonin. Uh, so that's one leading possible explanation, um, though there are others. What's more, uh, daylight also has cognitive benefits. It improves job satisfaction and workplace cognitive performance. And there are also studies that show that students in sunny classrooms have higher test scores than those in dark ones. Likewise, hospital patients in sunny rooms tend to fare better than those in shady ones. Uh, much like those who have views of nature, uh, they use fewer painkillers, report less stress, are discharged sooner, and even have lower mortality rates. So it's probably too late for a lot of us to say, reposition the windows in our homes, uh, but there are some other steps we can take to make the most of daylight. As I mentioned, daylight exposure is particularly valuable in the morning. So during this time when many of us are working at home, it might be worth finding a place to work in the morning that gets a lot of sunlight. Another thing you might want to explore is what's known as circadian lighting. This is a relatively new development and technology, and the idea is to create artificial lighting schemes that better mirror natural light and the way that it happens to change throughout the course of the day. So for instance, you can buy light bulbs, smart bulbs, that put out a sort of cool blue bright light in the morning that will really suppress your melatonin levels and tell your body that it's daytime. And then as the day goes on and evening approaches, the bulbs get dimmer and they start to put out a warmer light that's better for sleeping and getting ready for bed. Uh, finally, if your home is really dark, especially during these coming winter months, uh, you might want to consider getting a light therapy lamp, which can help boost alertness and mood. Um, but I do feel obligated to say that light therapy is considered a medical intervention, um, so I'm not officially endorsing it, uh, but suggesting it as something you might want to discuss with a doctor. Indoor air quality is something that I think a lot of us have been thinking about more in recent months, uh, largely because of the pandemic. And that's because we know that all sorts of potentially dangerous things can linger in indoor air. Um, the first, of course, is pathogens like the coronavirus that we are all preoccupied with. 
Um, but that's not all. Um, indoor air pollution is also a major problem. And all sorts of consumer products, all the things we stock our houses with, our furniture, our flooring, electronics, our personal care products, they all give out chemicals that can pollute the air in our homes and in other buildings. What's more, some of our own behaviors, especially it turns out cooking and cleaning, which I suspect a lot of us are also doing a lot more of in recent months, can also generate indoor air pollution. These pollutants at moderate to high levels can have well-documented health effects, uh, causing a variety of lung, heart, and vascular problems. But air pollutants can have cognitive effects too. Um, probably the most interesting example, I think, is that every time we exhale, of course, we are breathing out carbon dioxide. And it turns out that when there are a lot of people in a room or a room is poorly ventilated, so think about a crowded conference room or a full lecture hall, carbon dioxide levels can actually rise high enough to impair our thinking, which might explain a lot of the ideas that get thrown out in some of those uh, conference rooms. But studies also show, conversely, that increasing the supply of fresh air can both reduce those CO2 levels and boost our performance on cognitive tasks. So improving ventilation can have a variety of benefits, uh, dispersing and diluting both pathogens and pollutants and curbing the spread of infectious disease and reducing our exposure to all sorts of potentially toxic chemicals. There are a bunch of strategies uh, we can employ to do that. Um, sort of the most basic um, example is to simply increase the rate of ventilation. Um, so that is how frequently the air in the room is replaced by fresh air. And the specific rate that's ideal depends on room size and occupancy patterns. But for shared spaces with a lot of people, um, like think about school classrooms right now, Experts generally recommend five to six air changes per hour, which means that the air inside a room is being entirely replaced five or six times an hour. Um, that turns out to be a lot more frequently than happens in most schools now. Um, so we really need to think about how we can get those ventilation rates up. Uh, an additional strategy, if you happen to have some kind of central HVAC system in your home or office, you might be able to change the settings so you're boosting what's known as the outdoor air fraction. So this means that more fresh air is coming in from outside rather than having the system just recirculate the air that's inside. Um, of course, a low-tech way of doing the same thing is to open the windows. Uh, this might be the most achievable strategy in the months ahead. And um, to architects and designers who might be out there in the audience, I would like to put in a plug for making sure you create buildings that have operable windows. Um, we've really gotten away from that in a lot of buildings, especially commercial buildings. And so a lot of office workers today can't even open a window if they tried or if they wanted to. Um, finally, if you happen to have exhaust fans in your kitchen or in your bathroom, make sure you actually use them. Uh, it sounds like a no brainer, but research shows that most people, you know, only turn their range hood fan on if, you know, they're making something really smoky or really smelly. Um, but really, ideally, you should be using it all the time. A few more tips for the kitchen. Um, one is to use electric appliances. Uh, gas appliances and particularly gas stoves generate significantly more pollution than electric ones. If you can swap your gas stove for an electric one, that's far and away the best option from an air quality standpoint. Um, I understand that not everyone can do that. We actually have a gas stove in our apartment and we're renters, so we're kind of stuck with it. Um, but what you can do is try to swap out doing some kitchen tasks with electric appliances. So instead of heating up water on your gas stovetop, maybe use an electric kettle or use a toaster oven when you can that's electric rather than your gas stove. Uh, finally, one small trick if you do have a range hood is to cook on the back burner. It turns out that most range hoods cover the back burners much more completely than they do the front burners. And studies suggest that uh, far more pollution is removed from the air when people cook on their back burners instead of their front ones. 
depending what kind of ventilation system you have and your access to it, you may be able to install higher quality air filters, which can help trap particles and also droplets of fluid that could be carrying viruses like the coronavirus or other pathogens. Um, but it's also true that a lot of home ventilation systems aren't really made for these super heavy duty air filters, which are generally used in hospitals and, and industrial settings. So if that's not an option, this might be a good time to invest in a portable air cleaner. Um, and essentially these are standalone devices that are equipped with these high quality filters and can help remove um, both viral particles, but you know, anything else that's you know, lingering in, in your indoor air. So I just mentioned pathogens as one thing that can be contaminating our indoor air, but they're just a small component of the rich microbial wonderland that exists inside our buildings. Over the last decade, scientists have begun to catalog this indoor microbiome. They are going into schools, homes, offices, and other buildings, and they're swabbing surfaces and collecting samples of dust. And then what they can do is sequence all the DNA it contains. They can then compare that DNA to databases of known genomes of microorganisms, and they can essentially come up with this long list of all the microbes that they're finding hiding in our buildings. Their findings have been nothing short of astonishing. Um, to cite just one study, the average American home contains more than 2,000 types of microbes. And some of these species are originating outdoors. Um, they hitch rides inside by, you know, clinging onto our clothes or our pets or drifting in through open doors and windows. But some of these microbes are actually growing in our homes. They live in our walls, in our plumbing, in our air conditioning units, and our dishwashers. And a lot of indoor microbes, it turns out, are actually coming from us. We, of course, are populated by a diverse array of microbes. They're really critical partners in maintaining our physiological functions and our health. And whenever we move, we are shedding these microbes into the air and the spaces around us. So lots of these microbes um, are coating the inside of our homes. Researchers have also found that different areas inside our buildings form distinct habitats. Um, so some of this isn't terribly surprising, but to give a few examples, um, kitchen counters tend to harbor bacteria that's typically associated with and grows on food products, which is what you might expect. Um, dishwashers, on the other hand, tend to be strange and extreme environments. You know, they're regularly flooded with water, with heat, with detergent. And scientists have found that they're also home to some unique kinds of black yeasts that don't exist anywhere else. Uh, doorways in and on the outside of our homes are often covered in microbes that typically live in leaves and soil. And then you can think about something like pillowcases, which are a totally different type of environment, and they are dominated by bacteria that typically come from us, especially bacteria that live in and on human skin and in our mouths. So uh, I imagine some of you might be freaking out right now. Uh, that is not my intention. It is true that some of these indoor microbes can pose a danger to our health. Um, the one you're probably most familiar with, of course, is certain kinds of fungi uh, form molds that can trigger allergies and respiratory problems, and you definitely don't want that in your home. But the vast majority of indoor microbes are totally benign. Um, I mean, a lot of them, as I mentioned, are coming from us, and so they're already living on our bodies. And it turns out that some of these kinds of indoor microbes even have lifelong health benefits. So there's a growing body of research that suggests that kids who grow up in environments in which they're exposed to a rich diversity of microbes are less susceptible to asthma, allergies, and autoimmune disease. And scientists theorize that these exposures to lots of different microbes when we're young essentially are helping to train our immune systems and to teach them not to overreact to other threats and microbes we might encounter later in life. The research also makes clear that there is no 
typical indoor microbiome, and even the most basic design decisions can affect indoor microbial communities. Um, for instance, in one recent study of a university building, researchers found that spaces that were centrally located and highly occupied, so things like hallways and classrooms, had different bacterial populations than farther flung, more lightly occupied areas like faculty offices and mechanical rooms. What's more, the more connected two rooms were, that is the fewer doors a visitor had to walk through to get from one room to another, the more similar their microbial profiles. Finally, we know that permeability matters a lot. So the more tightly sealed a building is, the fewer microbes it will allow in from the outdoors, and the more it will be dominated by microbes that come from our own bodies. So for instance, rooms that are mechanically ventilated, like with some sort of central HVAC system, tend to be covered in these human associated microbes, while rooms that have open windows or natural ventilation tend to be home to more plant, soil, and water microbes that originate outside. So all this research, a lot of it's still in early phases, but it does raise the possibility that we can potentially cultivate healthier indoor microbiomes and ones in which there are fewer pathogens and more of these beneficial health promoting microbes. It's still an active area of research and there's a lot left to learn, but there are some basic steps we know we can take that are helpful. Uh, number one is to keep things dry. A lot of the fungi that hang out in our homes are essentially dormant as long as they don't get wet. But if there's a flood or a leak or even just some extra humidity, they can spring to life and begin to spread. Uh, another recommendation I have is to skip household products, uh, things like cleansers and paints and flooring that contains added antimicrobial chemicals. Um, so one you might have seen is called triclosan, but there are others similar to it. And it turns out that microbes rapidly adapt to these chemicals and using them in our homes could help drive the emergence of new superbugs and antibiotic resistant bacteria. Uh, in addition, coating the inside of our homes with these antimicrobial compounds also tends to wipe out any beneficial microbes that are present, which is, is not what we want to do. It's also important to think about ways to bring the outdoors in. So studies suggest that the microbes in soil and plants are among those that are good for kids' immune systems. So this could be another reason to consider things like getting some house plants or creating an indoor herb garden or figuring out other ways to bring nature into your home. Uh, open a window that will help allow some of these beneficial outdoor microbes to drift in. It also, of course, increases ventilation, which can help dilute any pathogens that you might happen to have indoors. Um, finally, and uh, maybe my favorite recommendation personally is to get a dog. It turns out that dogs really significantly increase the microbial diversity in a home, and they seem to introduce some of the microbes that are known to be good for the immune system. Studies show that kids who grow up in homes with dogs are less sensitive to allergens and less likely to develop asthma. So, so far, I've mostly been talking about some of the direct effects of the indoor environment. But indoor, indoor spaces also affect our health and well being indirectly by shaping our behavior. So, I'm going to talk through a couple of examples. So, let's start with workplace behavior. Research reveals that despite the rapid adoption of messaging software like Slack, in the workplace at least, face to face communication really remains the gold standard. Real life encounters are associated with higher productivity and performance, especially when the work is complex and teams are more cohesive when they communicate in person. It also suggests that physical proximity, which is something we're struggling with right now, um, is the best way to foster these interactions. So you're more likely to communicate with colleagues who have desks that are close to yours. That may sound obvious and intuitive, and to some degree it is, but it can have surprisingly far-reaching and significant effects. 
Uh, one of my favorite examples of this comes from a workplace analytics company called Humanize, which worked with a major European bank that wanted to figure out why some of its branches were much more successful than others. And Humanize uses a variety of wearable sensors to track workers' face-to-face -face social interactions. And when they did this in these bank branches, they found that workers in the highest performing branches were having more face-to-face -face communications than those in its underperforming branches. They also found some interesting patterns. So in some of the bank's low performing branches, employees seemed to have sorted themselves into two distinct social groups and members of each group rarely spoke to members of the other. Um, that's exactly what's happening in branch two here. Um, you can see the two for fairly um, unrelated social networks. And when the humanized researchers looked more closely at branches like branch two, it quickly became clear what was happening. These were two floor locations and employees on the first floor rarely went up the stairs to talk to those on the second floor and vice versa. It just took a few minutes to climb the stairs, but during busy work days, people just weren't doing it. In subsequent months, uh, the bank started a new practice of systematically rotating its employees between floors and the move paid off. It expanded employees' social networks and also sales at those branches increased 11% after they put that plan in, in place. So smaller design decisions matter too. And behavioral economists often talk about what they call nudges. And they've demonstrated that we can nudge or steer people towards certain choices by subtly altering the way that we present those choices. So if you've ever kept candy on your desk, you are probably familiar with the general principle that we are more likely to consume food when it's within easy reach. And the corollary to that then is that making wholesome food, healthy food, more prominent, accessible, and convenient, or conversely, making junk food more difficult to acquire, can nudge our diets in a healthier direction. This is a great demonstration of that idea. It comes from an elementary school where researchers did a simple milk swap. So typically at this school, both white and chocolate milk were readily available. They were stacked in neighboring crates in front of the lunch counter. Uh, but for a single week, the researchers hid the chocolate cartons behind the counter. And they posted a sign telling the students that if they wanted chocolate milk, all they had to do was ask for it. As a result of this one simple change, the share of students selecting white milk, which is of course healthier and lower in sugar, jumped from 30 to 48%. So that's nudging people into making healthier food choices. We can also design environments that nudge people into being more active. And the reason this is important is because research shows that incorporating even a little bit more movement into our daily routines can have real health benefits. Um, there are large longitudinal studies that show things like women who walk just 10 blocks a day or men who climb just three flights of stairs a day face lower odds of a variety of diseases and early mortality. But in a lot of ways, movement has been designed out of our buildings. Consider what you might see when you walk into a commercial building or a high rise. Uh, in most places, elevators get pride of place. They're prominently positioned in these bright gleaming lobbies and sort of practically demanding to be ridden. Um, stairwells, on the other hand, if you can find them at all, are often narrow, dark, hidden away behind heavy, imposing fire doors. So it's no wonder that most of us don't choose to take the stairs. In recent decades, a new movement known as active design has been gaining steam. And the goal of active design is essentially to flip this script, to create environments that help make movement and physical activity both the default choice and the most appealing choice. At the level of individual buildings, one key strategy of active design is to really embrace the power of stairs. And there are a variety of ways we can do that. Uh, to name just a few, studies show that we're more likely to take the stairs when staircases are highly visible, when they're convenient, 
when the stairs themselves are wider, when they're aesthetically appealing and also architecturally distinct. Displaying artwork or playing music in stairwells can also increase stair use. And so can what are sometimes known as stair prompts or highly visible signs that simply encourage people to take the stairs. So what all of these studies demonstrate is that we are creatures of convenience. So we're most likely to interact with people who are nearby, consume things that are within easy reach and engage in behaviors that are easy and appealing. That's not rocket science, uh, but it is something that can be useful to keep in mind because we can take advantage of those tendencies when we set up our indoor spaces. So think about ways you can organize your space to make desired behaviors easier and undesirable behaviors harder. To give a few examples, um, sort of the classic example is to put junk food out of reach in your pantry, maybe on a shelf that you need to get a, on a step stool to reach and then to put in its place healthy snacks, fruit, produce out in the counter where it's easy to see and grab. Um, if you have home exercise equipment like weights or a treadmill or a stationary bike, consider putting it in front of a window with an interesting or appealing view that you enjoy. Or to use an example that is especially relevant right now, um, you can consider doing what we've done in our apartment. Um, and that is to create what we essentially call a sanitation station. So we have a table that is right by our door and it is loaded up with hand sanitizer, disinfectant wipes, face masks, and it makes it really easy and automatic every time we come and go to grab a mask, to sanitize our hands um, and to do all of, take all those public health actions that are so important right now. So that's an overview of some of the main principles and findings in the field of evidence-based design. Um, what I'd like to do now is talk through a few case studies and show you some buildings that put these lessons into practice in hopes of accomplishing some specific goals. And let's start by venturing over to Sweden where designers wondered whether they could use evidence-based design to build a safer hospital. This is the Infectious Disease Building at a hospital in Malmo, Sweden, which was designed by the Danish architecture firm C.F. Müller. Administrators at the hospital began planning this building in 2005. So, of course, 15 years ago, uh, COVID-19 was not on the radar yet, but the administrators there were thinking a lot about another related coronavirus, and that is the one that causes SARS. So SARS actually spread in hospitals and emergency rooms where patients infected one another and the clinicians who were caring for them. That's not especially uncommon. Pathogens often spread in hospitals. And as you can imagine, that's a particular concern in a building that's dedicated to caring for people with infectious diseases as this building is. So when this hospital in Sweden decided to renovate and overhaul its infectious disease department, they decided to create a building that could operate safely in what they called the quote, post antibiotic era. So an age in which effective antibiotics are disappearing and epidemics are able to travel around the world at lightning speed, which we are getting a taste of right now. So one of the first things they did was think really carefully about paths of circulation and how patients would move around the building. Because as I mentioned, we are constantly shedding microbes. We know that the less that potentially infectious patients come into contact with others, the safer everyone will be. So in this new building, which you can see here, the emergency department and the outpatient clinic are on the first floor. And in addition to creating a typical waiting room indoors, the designers also decided to create these private isolation rooms that can be entered directly from the outdoors. So any incoming patient who's suspected of being contagious can go directly from the outside into one of these isolation rooms without having to spend any time, you know, sitting in a communal waiting room or sneezing or coughing or shedding their microbes. They also did something else pretty innovative. Um, as you might have noticed in the previous photos, these architects created a circular building. 
And if you look closely, you can see that there are these balconies that wrap all the way around the exterior of the second, third, and fourth floors. So these are the inpatient floors, and each inpatient room has a set of doors that opens directly onto these outdoor walkways. So when patients are admitted for an overnight stay or days long stay, they're taken to their rooms via these outdoor walkways. So they're not contaminating or shedding microbes into any of the indoor spaces. Here's a closer look at some of these walkways um, and it is Sweden. So as you can imagine, it can get pretty cold and blustery in the winter. So the design team created these glass slats uh, to help protect people from wind, rain and snow. But as you can see, they also allow a ton of fresh air in which helps disperse pathogens and reduces the odd of, odds of disease transmission. Then on the inside of the building, each patient room has another door, which opens onto an in indoor corridor. And these corridors are primarily used by the hospital staff. Here's an overhead view of the layout of one of these inpatient floors. Um, there's a lot going on here, I know, but you can sort of see the two rings, the exterior ring that patients and visitors use, and then the uh, interior ring that's used by staff. Uh, here's a closer view of a single patient room. Uh, you can see here both the inner and the outer corridors, uh, both marked with ones. And then the three here, the big space is the main part of the patient room. The bathroom is marked with the four, uh, but what I wanna call your attention to right now are the two small rooms marked with a two here. Um, these are ante rooms, and there's one on either side of the main patient room. So anyone who's entering or exiting a patient room from either corridor has to pass through one of these ante rooms. And the ante rooms have a couple of interesting features. Uh, one is that they have airtight doors and they're also pressurized, which keeps contaminated air from flowing into them. They also gave the designers a chance to make use of some behavioral nudges. So there is some research to suggest that providing conveniently located sinks and hand sanitizer can improve staff hand hygiene, reducing the odds that clinicians transfer bacteria from one patient to another. So in these ante rooms, there are sinks and hand sanitizer dispensers positioned really prominently. So it's very easy for staff and visitors to wash and disinfect their hands on both the way in and the way out. Uh, here's a photo of the inside of one of these patient rooms. Um, every room is private, so designed to be used by just a single patient rather than shared. And there's a lot of really strong evidence at this point that providing these single patient rooms can reduce the spread of infectious disease. Um, to give just one data point, uh, one study showed that when a hospital switched from shared ICU rooms to private ones, the rates at which patients acquired potential potentially um, infectious pathogens fell by more than 50%, and the average length of stay at the hospital declined by 10%. You'll also notice uh, that there are huge windows in these rooms, and so patients are getting tons of light, which we know is therapeutic. And the architects also thought about flexibility and deliberately designed it into these rooms. So although single patient rooms are really the gold standard and the ideal, these Rooms are deliberately oversized, so in the event of an outbreak or epidemic, uh, if the hospital suddenly needs to treat a lot more patients, they can transform all of these rooms into double rooms and essentially double their capacity. Uh, the patient rooms can also be converted into high-risk isolation rooms by bumping up the ventilation rates and locking the anteroom doors. So scientists have not yet formally analyzed patient outcomes here, um, but I did speak to the head of the infectious disease department, and he told me that his impression and the staff impression so far is that disease and infection seems to be less of a problem than it was at the old building um, and that the facility is working well. Uh, they have been treating COVID-19 patients in recent months, and it's been performing as it was designed to, and he said um, the 
staff feel safe. So um, the data is still, the, the jury's still out on some of that rigorous data, but early indications um, are promising. So uh, moving on to a second case study. Can we use evidence-based design to create a more active school? So this is Buckingham Primary and Elementary School in Dillon, Virginia. And it was designed by VMDO, an architecture firm in Charlottesville, Virginia, and designed entirely around the principles of active design. Um, I think we have one of the designers tuning in tonight, so a shout out to her if she's here. But this is the lobby of the elementary school. And as you can see, the designers really embrace the power of stairs, which are front and center. I mean, you can't miss them when you walk in the door. They're well lit. And you can't see it in this photo, uh, but when I visited a few years ago, the school staff had posted a bunch of large superhero decals along the glass wall above the landing here. So the characters are essentially greeting kids as they climb up and down the stairs. They also have playful stair prompts uh, mounted throughout the building at all of the staircases. Here's a closer look at one of them. The designers also wanted to really encourage students and teachers to walk more and to move throughout the building over the course of the day. So instead of you know, these long featureless corridors, they created what they called learning streets, which were studded with reading nooks and small group workspaces that were stocked with colorful movable furniture. They also hid animal tracks um, from a variety of different local species um, in the floor of the building itself. Um, the hope was to sort of enliven the experience of walking and to make it rewarding and fun for kids. To encourage healthy eating, uh, the design team decided to think of the cafeteria as a classroom. So they created this open airy dining commons right in the heart of campus. And they deliberately decided to keep the food preparation process visible by doing away with any sort of walls or physical separation between the kitchen where the food was prepared and the dining area where students were eating it. They also shared some of the research lessons about food nudges uh, with the school staff, recommending that the schools make healthy foods especially prominent and easy for students to see and grab. In addition, they created several dedicated spaces for hands-on food education, including a kitchen lab, which was scaled to student size, as well as a food library and a kitchen garden. And they created a variety of colorful educational signs about things like the benefits of water, um, where food comes from, and the components of a healthy meal, which are posted throughout the school. So there have been several uh, post-occupancy studies of the school and researchers have found some encouraging signs. Um, they've documented some modest but measurable increases in nutritional knowledge. Um, students they surveyed and spoke to in focus groups said that some of these new facts they'd learned in fact from the signs that were posted around the building. Uh, researchers also used accelerometers to monitor students' daily movements. And they discovered that the new schools did in fact seem to make the kids less sedentary. And overall, they concluded the schools appeared to increase the amount of light physical activity that students got by about an hour a day, which is a huge increase. And they even documented some benefits for teachers. In one post-occupancy survey, they found that the share of staff members who said they were eating high-fat diets had decreased from 74% to 57%. Uh, finally, uh, one last case study. Can we use evidence-based design to create a more humane jail? This is Las Colinas Detention and Reentry Facility in Santee, California. And the original Las Colinas opened as a juvenile detention facility in 1967 and then eventually became a women's jail. 
In the early 2000s, though, uh, the county and the sheriff's office decided it wanted to overhaul the facility, and they specifically wanted to create something a bit different from your standard jail. They wanted a secure complex, obviously, but also one that would promote socialization and allow women to move around with relatively few physical barriers. So a two-firm partnership, um, HMC Architects and KMD Architects, won the job. HMC was a local firm that had designed a lot of schools and educational facilities prior to this, and it thought it could leverage that experience to create a complex that felt more like a college campus than a jail. So they created an open park-like campus with meandering walking paths and numerous outdoor recreational spaces. They put the amenities, um, which include a large outdoor amphitheater and grassy areas they imagined being used for things like Frisbee and soccer, um, right in the center. And they've deliberately made the security features inconspicuous, sort of hiding the perimeter fencing behind careful landscaping. Here's another rendering of the campus, which opened in 2012. And most of the women at Las Colinas are classified as being a low security risk, which comes with a variety of privileges. Um, most notably, the ability to walk around the campus, you know, from their specific housing unit to the cafeteria to one of several classroom buildings um, without an escort. So it's a certain element of freedom, albeit in, in a circumscribed way. This is the day room in one of the low security housing units. Um, the designers embraced an idea known as normalization or the notion that correctional facilities should look less like impersonal institutions and more like an actual home. So they deliberately steered clear of the traditional furniture and fixtures you might see in a correctional facility. So there are no concrete benches, um, metal tables bolted to the ground. Um, instead, you have what looks like more quote unquote normal furniture here. Uh, you can also see uh, obviously the panoramic photo of the beach in the, the back of this day room. Every housing unit at Las Colinas has one of these nature landscapes that all come from um, around different places around the county. So this is another view of a day room in a different housing unit. You can see the living area just beyond the day room. It's open plan um, without cells, doors, or locks. And the other thing to take note of in this photo is the desk all the way on the left. That's where the corrections officer who's on duty is stationed. And you'll notice that this is an open station uh, right in the middle of the day room. There's no closed guard tower, locked office, no physical separation between the corrections officers and the women that they're overseeing. So this is a model known as direct supervision. And researchers have repeatedly found that it produces jails that are objectively safer with lower rates of violence and assaults than the classic model of what's known as indirect supervision. That might sound counterintuitive, uh, but the theory behind it is that when you remove physical barriers between corrections officers and inmates, you allow them to build better, more trusting relationships. And corrections officers can intervene in problems or tensions before they escalate. Um, so you're essentially turning these officers or guards into less of a security guard and more of a social worker who is relying on communication, conflict resolution, and counseling. So in 2015, a corrections consulting firm conducted a post-occupancy evaluation, interviewing staff and detainees about Las Colinas and what they thought of it. And both the inmates and the staff almost universally liked the design. The women said they liked the sense of community that the dormitory style accommodations fostered and the direct supervision model. Um, guards also said they felt less stressed than they had at the previous facility. And though initially they'd been skeptical of the direct supervision model, um, they came to really like it. Uh, nearly all of them reported that they preferred it to being tucked away in an office. 
the improvements in uh, the women's behavior was also remarkable. Um, after the new facility opened, the number of assaults fell by roughly 50%. So it's a little too early to say whether facilities like Las Colinas improve long-term outcomes, but the county is beginning to track that and to keep track of how many of the women who have been there return to custody, as well as other elements of you know, educational and um, post-incarceration outcomes. Now, I do wanna close this section uh, with one clarification. And that is that this is still absolutely a correctional facility. Um, sometimes people who oppose criminal justice reform criticize places like this as being like, quote, country clubs for criminals or spas for criminals. Um, and they're absolutely not. Uh, the women who are detained here still have their freedoms curtailed in a variety of ways. And there are higher security areas that look a bit more like what you might expect a typical jail to look like. So this is not a country club or a spa, and it's a real disservice to describe it that way. Um, the other clarification or caveat is that this is only part, a tiny part of a solution to an enormous criminal justice problem we have in this country. Um, we desperately need reforms that go beyond designing like quote unquote nicer jails and prisons. Um, we need to invest in things like restorative justice and decarceration. Um, I think all of those things are really important. Um, but that said, correctional facilities are not going away. And I think there's a lot of value in minimizing the harms that they cause. Um, so we should be sending far fewer people to jails and prisons, but we should also be treating them better while they are there. So those are some examples of how powerful the built environment can be. Um, I just wanna close with a few additional caveats. The first one is that indoor environments are complex. Variables can interact in complicated and sometimes surprising ways. Um, a lot of this research and these relationships are not simple. Um, to give a few examples, um, there's a study that shows that when an office is dark, noisy, or cold, workers are less satisfied with the air quality, even if the air quality itself doesn't change objectively. Similarly, uh, when background noise increases, people tend to have more complaints about the air temperature. So that's another way in which our experience of one element of an indoor environment can color our subjective experience of the environment as a whole. So buildings are complex, uh, but people are also complex. And research makes clear that there's no one environment that's ideal for all people or for all tasks. Uh, anyone who's worked in an office is probably familiar with the infamous office thermostat wars. Um, an office that feels balmy to one employee can feel freezing to a colleague in the neighboring cubicle. Individuals vary enormously in their thermal preferences, but in general, women tend to be more sensitive to temperature changes than men are and to prefer warmer workspaces. And it's not just a matter of comfort. It turns out that that women actually score better on cognitive tests at warmer air temperatures, while men do better at cooler ones. Which means that an office that's calibrated to men's thermal preferences, as many offices are, might actually be making it harder for female employees to perform at their peak. Likewise, uh, different environments are good for different kinds of tasks. Um, so the research here is complicated and nuanced, uh, but there are intriguing studies that suggest things like cooler, bluer light might be ideal for alertness and for multitasking, but warmer, more amber colored light might actually be better when what you want to prioritize is creativity. So even though there are a lot of evidence-based principles we can use to design healthier, happier spaces, there are no one size fits all environments. And design is not a silver bullet. It's not gonna even come close to solving all of our problems. But if we're careful and thoughtful about it, it can nudge us in the right direction. It can help us make us healthier, happier, and more productive. And it can be essentially an infrastructure 
on which we build a better future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. That was a great, uh, great talk. And um, like I said before, the uh, book is so accessible um, from uh, for many of us um, who are not in the scientific world, um, but also uh, generally interested in um, how our uh, interior spaces uh, make so much impact on us, um, whether we know it or not. Um, of course, I'd like to address the elephant in the, in the room, and that's uh, COVID-19. And um, the fact that your book was researched, well-researched, uh, well before we knew uh, the impacts of COVID-19. And I would uh, like to start off our Q&A um, first off by mentioning that if you in our listening audience have a question to please uh, ask it through our Q&A chat um, at the bottom of your screen. But um, uh, certainly I'd love to know what have you learned? Uh, what's new in store uh, because of um, the impact of COVID-19? Yeah, I mean, so as you mentioned, like this was actually, the text was finalized and it was off to the publisher before the disease even really arrived in the U.S. So, you know, pan uh, COVID-19 doesn't appear anywhere in the book. Um, you know, fortunately, I don't think the pandemic radically alters any of my conclusions or any of the things I learned, but I think it does is likely to accelerate some of the trends that I was finding. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, in terms of definitely people are more likely to be paying attention to their indoor environments now and things like indoor air quality, which, you know, historically had not gotten as much attention as outdoor air quality. Scientists were beginning to sort of reverse that a bit over the last decade. And there was more discussion and research on it. But obviously I think something like, pandemic of a respiratory disease is really going to accelerate interest in indoor air quality. Um, so there are other trends like that that I think are going to be basically fast-tracked because of the pandemic. Of course. Um, you've written a, a disparate um, uh, kinds of um, books before, and uh, we have a question from Emily, um, excuse me, Emma, who says, um, I'm an interior design student. Uh, what motivated you to write this book? Yeah, so I'm a science writer. And so I definitely come at this from that background. Like, I don't have a background in architecture or design. Um, and so maybe it's not surprising that the initial spark here was some of that micro work research. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time reading scientific articles and perusing scientific journals. And about a decade ago, I noticed all these studies starting to come out, just chronicling the, to me, mind boggling diversity of the creatures that live in our buildings. And that was sort of an aha moment for me, not just in terms of the findings themselves were staggering, but it was like, oh, like my home is an ecosystem and I'd never thought of it that way before. And then just opening my eyes to, there's all this stuff happening in our buildings that we don't see, we don't think about, we don't appreciate. And, you know, if that was true of microbes, what else was it true of? Um, so that sort of launched a much broader investigation. Right. So, and, and it's fascinating to me that you went from that literally micro scale level to uh, the macro scale level of um, architecture and interior. Um, what what fostered that leap? Um, well, so I had written like a standalone story back in, I think, 2007 or 2008 about collaborations between architects and neuroscientists. Um, at the time, my beat was sort of a neuroscience beat. And so when I saw the microbe stuff, I sort of remembered having worked on that story and research on you know, the mind and indoor spaces. And so I think that helped prime my brain to be able to like make these interdisciplinary connections. Um, and then it was just like diving into the literature and turns out I did not lack for material, you know, like there are chapters 
I didn't have time or space to include. There is too much, not too little. Yeah. Well, um, I, I must say that your exploration into your um, shower uh, <laughs> shower head was <laughs> pretty amazing. And um, again, another sort of example of the way that you write about um, the interior uh, world, um, not our minds, but our you know physical interior world was very engaging. Um, We've got another question uh, from, I must say, our interim executive director, Brent Glass, who asks, uh, do you or your colleagues know how interior museum and exhibition design uh, affects the visitor experience? Um, I mean, the short answer is no. Uh, researchers may, I know there are, um, papers on museum experience. Um, I think particularly relevant is wayfinding, which is actually something I think is really interesting that, that is one of those chapters that didn't make it in. I mean, that was sort of one of the first real collaborations between neuroscientists and designers was this idea of how do we locate, make mental maps and locate ourselves in space. And it's can be a challenge in a place like a museum, big vast museum. Um, Unfortunately, I don't know off the top of my head, like what the current recommendations are. Um, but um, I know there are papers out there on it. Sure. Um, is there any way to rank uh, the importance of the very aspects of interior spaces with regard to health and well-being? Um, in other words, is light more important than fresh air? or surface materials and colors more important than a room layout or space allocation? Yeah, I mean, that's really tricky. I think... I mean, I know, I think I've, I've read often in your book um, over and over again that it's different for every different user. Yeah, so I mean, it, it partly depends like what what you're optimizing for. And, you know, another one of the like overarching lessons is that there are trade-offs and lots of design decisions have trade, you know, like I preach a lot about the importance of letting in fresh air and opening windows, but that can have an energy cost. And so like, there are always trade-offs. I don't know that I could do a ranked list. I think there are definitely tiers. So like I would put light and, fresh air and clean air like up there really in the top tier with like something like wall color being somewhat less important. Um, I mean, I don't know, I don't know that I could pick between like light and, and air for instance, but I think those are among the top priorities. Well, as someone who um, lives by at least one or two fans moving the air in my uh, living space at any given time, um, I'm an advocate for that. Um, um, uh, in terms of windows that don't open and uh, prominent elevators instead of stairs, are we fighting against codes and ADA? This comes from an anonymous viewer tonight. Yeah, um, I, I'm really glad someone brought up the ADA because it's something I talk about in several places throughout the book, um, but also as it relates to active design. Um, and that's something that designers need to be really careful about. Um, there are some strategies that make buildings more active that also make them less accessible, but there are some that do not. Um, sure. so like for instance, making elevators harder to access and farther away from the door and particularly things like skip stop elevators or there are even buildings that have deliberately slowed elevator speeds to disincentivize people from taking them. Like those are not good for accessibility. Um, but something like making a stairwell more appealing, putting art and music in it, putting up stairwell prompts, like that's something that doesn't have that same cost. Um, so that is a really important thing to consider. Um, and there are definitely better strategies and worse strategies from that point of view. Um, but I, yeah, I, I would not want promotion of physical activity to come at the expense of accessibility. Right. Which is more important, uh, the aesthetics of architecture and interior design 
or the ethics? Um, I know you're coming at this, you're, you're not answering this as a, an architecture person. Uh, well, yeah, I was about to say that I probably have a bias here in that I do not have an architectural or design background. So I would put the ethics first, um, which maybe not all designers would do. But that said, like, I'm not sure that's an especially neat cleaving. Um, I mean, you could certainly, like, if nature has all these benefits for health and stress in the immune system, then like, is a nice landscape? Is that an aesthetic choice? Or is that something that we all have a basic right to? So, you know, I would say, ethics and well-being and human functioning is most important, but it's not necessarily neatly separable from the aesthetics necessarily. Yeah. yeah. So one of my um, favorite chapters was um, the cure for the uh, common cubicle, um, only because uh, at the building museum a, a few years ago, we went from, most of us went from a uh, cubicle organization to open plan system and um how did that go i well uh I, it 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 worked for us um it worked for the education department in the sense that um uh the department which consisted of adult programming and um teen programming and uh family and youth uh programming uh, were, were, had been had been siloed before, um, um, but um, in, in going to this open floor plan system, uh, we became more uh, cooperative and interactive. Um, it also was based on the fact that our um, space uh, was not your typical, you know. Rectilinear, rectilinear walls and um, uh, floor and ceiling, but rather an arched, you know, open passive passageway, uh, part of our um, historic building architecture. So um, I was curious about that chapter um, in your book. And, um, you know, had we, we had only done this uh, two or three years ago and we hadn't been able to uh, assess, um, you know, the results of it. Um, I found it, um, you know, pleasurable and uh, a, a worthwhile in work environment. But I see that, um, you know, it didn't address all of the uh, sort of uh, issue uh, issues that other folks um, would have wanted. And so I was curious if you could ex expand a little bit on your um, chapter about that. Yeah, I mean, so a couple of things, you know, like this definitely, um, you know, this is an area where your mileage may vary and there's no one size fits all solution. Like there may absolutely be workplaces where open plan office is not just fine, but the best solution, um, you know, it depends on your work place culture, it depends on the specific design, it depends on the task, it depends on all sorts of things. That said, like on balance, the evidence is pretty convincing that in general, open plan offices are not good for employees. They're good for employers. Um, but, you know, and that's from a variety of perspectives, like noise and distraction, um, physical health, you know, even before the pandemic, which you can imagine is not, you know, conducive to open plan offices. Like there were studies showing that people who work in open plan offices take more sick days, which is, you know, easy to imagine because of how germs spread. And yeah, I mean, some employers have said they have moved to open plan offices to foster collaboration, but there's also fairly good evidence, that, though that can work and you know it might have worked for you guys it doesn't necessarily even have that benefit because if the norm that springs up is oh i don't want to um interrupt or distract my coworkers, we must be quiet i don't want my conversation to be overheard there are actually workplaces where going to open plan office 
is decreases face-to-face -face communication and mm -hmm. employees take those conversations to um, Slack or to email. Um, so in general, it, it seems the costs to workers outweigh the benefits, but I acknowledge that that might not be true for every single person or workspace. Yeah. Um, I know I've totally dominated um, this <laughs> conversation with my own questions, but um, uh, Dina asks, what do you imagine is the next frontier for architecture, whether it's a current blind, blind spot or an emergent theme? What might that be? Um, well, so for literal next frontier, I just feel obligated to point out that the very last chapter of my book looks at how we might build space colonies. So I think that's really fun. And if you refer to it as the red planet, right? Yes. Um, so I'd encourage people to check that out. But in terms of like maybe more short term and especially what's happening now, um, I think flexibility and adaptability are going to become huge or even bigger um, some there's even bigger premium on, you know, like all of a sudden we're seeing what happens when we have to turn our homes into our offices and into classrooms for our kids. And, you know, this pandemic will eventually knock on wood go away, but, you know, the sort of only certainty is more uncertainty. There will be other crises and disasters and pandemics. And so I think the more we can think about creating buildings that are flexible and can have multiple uses. Um, I think that's going to be something that a lot of both occupants and designers prioritize. Um, so that's one answer. I mean, the other thing which we haven't really talked much about that I also talk about some in the book is the technology piece. So like how sensors are being increasingly built right into the bones of buildings. Um, and whether that's for convenience, so like for thermal comfort, but also increasingly for health. So you're seeing like floor sensors that can detect gate changes and detect falls. And so, you know, there's a lot that still needs to be worked out there, but I think that's another, you know, next frontier is sort of the- What's that called? Um, specialized works, uh, personalized workspace or something? Yeah, but also homes, just like intelligent building intelligent and adaptive architecture, I think is um, another big coming trend. Yeah. Um, to that point, are we too reliant on technology to solve uh, these um, issues when simpler um, uh, possibilities exist? I think sometimes, yes. I mean, and like ventilation is a good example of that. You know, like when you think about what's happened to our buildings or what happened over the course of the 20th century, like as air conditioning and technology and, um, you know, building technology improved, we created these like really hermetically sealed buildings to like, quote unquote, protect us from the outdoor world um, and for sustainability reasons too. But, um, you know, I think we're learning that we've gone too far in that direction and that we need to be creating indoor spaces that are more permeable to the outdoors. And like, yeah, maybe instead of some super high tech HVAC system, there are times when just like an operable windows would suffice. Yep. Um, so, you know, technology can do wonderful things. I'm not anti-technology. I'm a, a science and technology writer, but um, I don't think it's always the best or simplest answer. Yeah. Well, I would be remiss in um, certainly not suggest uh, mentioning that the National Building Museum, this grand four story uh, brick building um, in the heart of Washington, D.C., was designed by an, uh, an engineer uh, for the Army Corps of Engineers, um, not an architect, and featured the first uh, sort of um, air circulation pattern uh, in uh, the city and maybe the country um, based on openings beneath windows and then clear stories for four stories above that would allow the air to interchange at a regular uh, um, basis. So um, 
although it doesn't operate these days because we are a museum and need to maintain our uh, environmental control, um, it was a forerunner in, in sort of that uh, immediate, um, uh, you know, way of uh, prov uh, providing fresh air at the time. So um, let's go to one more question maybe before we leave. Um, how about our scientists learning? things with hard evidence that have been canons of what's considered good design, um, even though centuries ago, those kinds of things couldn't be measured. And it kind of goes with a question that I had, which, or not a question, but more about a comment about um, old things are new again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in some cases, absolutely. Like not in all cases, but you know, I think the history here is really interesting. And one place where I talk about it is hospital design and, you know, reformers like Florence Nightingale, who really pushed the importance of light and air in reducing mortality rates in hospitals and in infection rates. And, you know, when she was proposing that and making those observations, like germ theory wasn't even, you know, right. widely accepted yet. Like it was the biological basis of these diseases was not understood, but she'd still like made those observations and she had an intuition about what was and wasn't good for patients. So now we have plenty of data that backs that up. But like the idea that we want to be providing light and fresh air and opening buildings up is, you know, it's not a novel modern scientific idea. Right. Um, I know we only have a few moments left. You had a, huge chapter about incarceration mm. and um is there anything you'd like to share about that um anything additional you'd like to share about incarceration and the architecture of incarceration yeah i mean i guess um you know, we didn't talk, or I, I talked about sort of efforts to reform it in the presentation. I didn't talk much about like the long history of how horrible it can be and, you know, particularly exemplified by solitary confinement, which is just like one of the most damaging things we can do to a human being. Um, yes. I mean, I think fortunately opinions are changing on that, like slowly, too slowly, but um you know, and that's one reason, one thing I found interesting in that history is like solitary confinement itself came about as a reform to prison systems. And it was thought that like isolating people and giving them space to reflect was more humane than other kinds of punishments. And we turned out to be really wrong about that. Yeah. And so like, that's one reason I think it's important to, as we see these newer, like more humane correctional facilities to actually track outcomes and not assume that this thing we think is going to be better is going to be better. Um, so there's an interesting and long and um, not very illustrious history there. Yeah. Well, Emily, I'm so very grateful for you to um, share your research. And uh, like I mentioned to you earlier um, today, it's such a, an accessible book. Uh, the, the, the way you present the research that you've done over the year, uh, past few years is um, incredibly uh, informative and I'm glad you were able to be here with us uh, tonight. Um, I'd like to say thank you to everyone who's joined us. Uh, a reminder again that um, this program is recorded and we will be presenting it on our website in uh, a few short days. So thank you again, Emily, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much for having me and thanks for tuning in everyone. Good night. <laughs>